We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts, it's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts, it's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts, it's about the landscape you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts. It's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts, it's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts. It's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts, it's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts, it's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts. It's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts, it's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts, it's about the landscape, you know? Hi, Sharif. Hey, Allison, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks. I'm so excited you're here in Pittsburgh with us. It's really great to be here, always. Um, so you have a really amazing Pittsburgh art story, even though you're in Syracuse now. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, actually, I came from an art family, and when I say that, I mean, you know, my um, my aunts and uncles and cousins and brothers and sisters are all really great drawers and doodlers, but I was the first of the litter, so to speak, uh, to really invest in the arts with regards to education. And I would say that that kind of started when I was in fourth grade when my art teacher recommended me to the uh, Saturday Museum program at the Carnegie here. And that kind of, you know, in some ways, launched my curiosity and journey into the arts. Nice. And there's been some other pretty instrumental arts organizations in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, and you know, from the Carnegie program, I was really excited to win the uh, pre-college scholarship to, the, to CMU. Um, and then um, I got involved with the Manchester Craftsman's Guild. And once I started working with the Manchester Craftsman's Guild and, and building my portfolio, I was really literally going away to do something somewhere else every summer. Um, as far as Bennington College in Vermont, of course locally at IUP and Slippery Rock, um, and it, it really was life-changing in that um, they had a wonderful visiting artist program, 
So maybe three or four times a semester, somebody was flying in to share their journey and their, their experiences in the arts and, and their aesthetic trajectories and, and professional journeys. And it really opened up so many possibilities for me of what, what the arts can be. I mean, there's this obvious uh, myth of the starving artist and you know, that's just a hobby. But I, I was always kind of looking into the horizon and seeing possibilities uh, in the arts since I was a kid. It's awesome, learning from the masters. Indeed. So, long story short, you ended up at PGC somehow. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's interesting related to what I already like foreshadowed. So again, as early as uh, ninth grade, I was going away all the time. And you know, growing up in, in Beltsuver, which is, is, especially back then, it was really a wonderful community, but in some regards, kind of insular. And as the community got, you know, rougher in many regards, I was kind of going away more often. So I kind of, uh, you know, literally dodged a bullet in some ways, but also in, in exchange for that, um, my, my thirst for experience was nurtured. So again, I talked about going out to Bennington College when I was, you know, maybe 15 years old. And from that point on, I was, I was always reaching out to do something else and excited about the impact a new facility and a new community would have on my work. Um, in the 90s, I was in the former Czechoslovakia for a couple of years studying at the Academy of Fine Arts and uh, Design in Bratislava, specifically wax casting, um, excuse me, uh, lost wax casting and bronze. So it was a new experience doing something new with a new group of people. So I, um, I think I saw online the idea, idea Furnace program. And of course, you know, Pittsburgh is my hometown. And also Pittsburgh is kind of new. Right, because uh, this area was 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 not an area where where I could hang out in when I was a kid. It was you know divided by that time by uh, just the, the troubling you know landscape of uh, you know, economic challenges and gang violence and things like that. I mean, I went to middle school just around the block here at Rogers uh, Kappa, but by that time um, it had really changed. So in some regards, you know, it was a homecoming, but Pittsburgh is is a it's like a new place for me. It really is. So I'm kind of getting to know an old friend all over again in some oh, ways. Oh, that's exciting. So tell us about um, how glass has kind of been something new and exciting for you to experiment with. Well, I talked about, you know, my, my thirst for, for different kinds of experiences in the arts and my interest in forging different communities. And, and of course, you probably noticed my gregarious nature. <laughs> I um, do know that about you. <laughs> um, I think that it, in some regards, it's, it's, it's really about problem solving. I think that the thing, you know, we talked, I mean, even like last night this came up where, where uh, Ashley, who's one of the, the, the techs here and helps in glass casting, and she said, I don't know, I'm not sure I should be a part of this. I said, you know, one of the things that we showcase is, is the relationships that are forged through these kinds of experiences. I mean, I came here not knowing anything at all, like about glass, at all. Right. Like nothing. <laughs> And, um, and interestingly, there's there been some applicable experience, and you learn that there's some affinities between glass and clay. Mm -hmm. Certainly, affinities between lost lost wax casting and and, and, and kiln casting. But um, there are there are people who kind of you know forge together to solve problems, and and I love meeting problem solvers who are equipped to uh, tackle different kinds of problems. And there so, are many of those here. At yeah, PGC. so sometimes from a scientific, sometimes from a conceptual or aesthetic point of view, but uh, but I like mixing it up with people. So most importantly, what I learned is there's a, a very different kind of pace in, in glass, and especially in casting. Of course, we'll see something different in the hot shop with, with blowing glass, but but still, it's there are different considerations to make. You know, we're we're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat working with viscosity, working with light, but at the same time, you know, there's a very different uh, way to orchestrate those elements to create works. And, and for me, it's kind of like I'm, I'm doing the potty dance, you know, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm waiting because clay has, is, is such a visceral experience where, you know, sometimes, and this is not a slight against glass, but I, I feel like I'm waiting for, for paint to dry, you right. know, and I'm, and I'm used to being kind of the one-man show to accept you know, the, 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 the realities of time. Sure, and, and, it's, and rely on a team of people. Glass is all about a team, right? And it's, it's been good. I mean, I, th I think I couldn't do this, you know, I couldn't have done this 20 years ago. I wasn't patient enough. Mm. So I like to think I'm older and wiser. So nice. Kind of, <laughs> I got this, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you certainly have been making a name for yourself in, in the world of ceramics and, and glass now, too. Um, you had a big exhibition at one of our national museums, the Renwick, recently. Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, it was kind of like, and I, I know I'm dating myself, but it's like Ed McMahon, you know, knocking on your door, you know, but in, in some ways it was like this kind of sweepstakes experience where, uh, you know, a group of curators got together and the, uh, the Renwick Invitational is an exhibition that takes place every couple of years. And essentially what happens is a, a group of curators, usually three or four, get together and decide that there are artists worthy of greater national or international exposure. So literally working to kind of pull artists out of the margins and into the center. And I was delighted to discover, because I didn't know this at the time, but of the, art, of the curators who got together, I was on everyone's shortlist. Wow. And I had no idea. And that's the thing about working in the arts too, is like, you never know the kind of impact you're making. And, and also in this kind of digitized world, our, our careers are, are archived in such a way that is, is quite powerful. So when I, when I started to talk to these curators about my work and, and they called me up and said, you know, would you like to exhibit at the Smithsonian Museum of American Arts? Like, hell yeah. Like, yeah, right. Who <laughs> would say so, no? Yeah, like who's, let, let me think about it. <laughs> um, but it was, it, was, it was quite an honor to, to realize how versed they were in my story. You know, it's like, you know, they're talking about things that I, I was doing in 2007. That's very exciting. And if I'm not mistaken, some of them saw the show that happened here at PGC. So they, they, they flew in for the glass show, and, um, and it was really actually a pretty exciting day, because the, the Glass Center show was like, I, I, I can't even describe the uh, enthusiasm, because I literally had back-to-back -back appointments with uh, Abraham Thomas at the uh, Rimwick Museum I mean, River Gallery at the Smithsonian, and then Rachel Delphia at uh, Carnegie, nice. two days apart. So it's like, all of a sudden, museums are taking an interest in making acquisitions of my work, you know, starting from that Glass Center show. And even still, you know, I recently sold a piece to the Museum of, of Fine Arts in Houston, and, um, and the curators there saw the show at the Glass Center. And that was like Wonderful. when they became familiar with my work. That's so three incredible. different museums essentially got my work by way of that show. Can you talk about how um, working with glass is different than working with ceramics and how you've been able to incorporate glass into your existing work? Yeah, I mean, I realized that it, it's a different pace and, and I also realized uh, that it's, it's a lot more, well, time is money. So it's a lot more expensive. The material is a lot more costly. Yeah. But, but again, I, I kind of talked a little bit about my kind of uh, selfish nature as the kind of artist who wants to close the door and, and do my thing and, and, and kind of will what I want to will. Well, and but, a lot of times you're working on your own, right? Yeah. Like just in your house or in your studio. But I, I have a slide that I show when I conduct lectures and talk about the differences between clay and glass. And there's one slide of my home studio and it has like, I think probably 150 beads. They're just tumble stacked all over each other. It's a beautiful visual. And I said, this is a full kiln of clay beads. And then I click the next slide and I say, this is a full kiln of glass beads. And it's like <laughs> six. Eight, eight, six, it's like six or eight max. And that's kind of right. pushing it. And then of course, the other thing is that we have to like divest the mold. We have to cold work. So we're, we're talking about the belt sander, sandblasting. So after these pieces are realized in their, their glass form, there's still a lot of refining. And that part I tend to like. So mm -hmm. even, even now, like um, there's the other thing about glass is that I'm understanding more about this because of you can have a vision and not have the skill set. And that's another reason why, you know, it's important to kind of find ways of working with other people. That's not as common in ceramics. It's not like make me a three, a th a three foot vase and I will have you add, you know, this to it. And then right. she'll help me paint the fish on the side. There are people who work in that way, but I also had to understand that that kind of collaborative a action is a little bit more common in, in working in glass because I couldn't possibly begin to scratch the surface in, in, in glowing glass, but it's also interesting to kind of uh, design and, and direct and realize potential forms in, in glass by way of either shop, the kiln shop or the, or the hot shop. So, um, so as it pertains to the, to the pace, it's, and it also, it's contingent on a facility, you know? Mm -hmm. I've, I'm used to working in my living room with my kids and in the basement, and I mean, I, I literally work everywhere. So I, I, unfortunately, I can't just carry a backpack of molten metal right. or molten glass <laughs> around. But, you know, it'd be nice like to have a dispensary, but it's, it's a very different kind of mechanism. And, and the facility, it, it, it really, uh, to, to, I, mean, I know there's portable versions of it, 
but it, it's never going to be as practical as something I can do in my living room. Sure. You know, and clay, I, I've kind of even even though people don't see clay that way, because it's so common and because it's so ubiquitous, you know, it's used in contexts all over the world, and 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 some of them are are well facilitated, and some of them are still making amazing works for little to no facility. So places like PGC are really sort of enabling that ability to experiment and expand your practice. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it's it's kind of like it's kind of looking at it from two different two different points of view because I love iron for the same reason is that I that I kind of love glass, but I, I love this idea that that there are endeavors that are really, really dependent on a community. Yeah. You know, and 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 I think there's also kind of a shared pride, even though it's kind of mine, mm -hmm. you know, I see people get excited about helping me achieve things. Right. I agree completely. I love watching the team here work. Um, so tell us what's what's next for you. What are you working on now? Um, <clears throat> as far as my work's concerned, you know, I've been really prolific during the quarantine. I was I was on a sabbatical last semester and, um, and it was really amazing to have a home facility. So I just gardened and made stuff in my studio, come up for air and weed, and nice. I go back in. And, um, and um, I have a couple of exhibitions on the horizon that I'm working toward that have obviously been postponed. But I'm really not, um, I'm not fretting the fact that they've been postponed because it's, it's really given me some more time to, to invest in the work yeah. and, um, and kind of take stock of you know, what's really happening. Because time is always of the essence, but obviously if you have more time, there, there are more potentials for you know, I guess one of the ways that I look at it is I, I like to be able to respond to the energy I create. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like the energy comes in out and, and goes out the other door. Yeah. And it's, it's nice that people are interested in your work. But it, it's like, it's like in some ways, I know this sounds a little bit touchy-feely, but it, it feels like uh, it's like you raise children and they leave right away. And it's yeah. like, wait, 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 I, I want to I be proud of you. I want to cheer, show you off. Sure. I want to tell everybody what you're doing. You can't just jump ship just yet. Yeah. And, and sometimes I make things and I really want to keep them around the studio and I want to respond to them. So I like the idea of, uh, of being able to, to, to react to the, to the energy I'm creating. So I haven't really been in the place in a long time where I'm surrounded by my work. And at, at one point it was a bad, it was a, it was a bad thing. Was right. Like, some of this stuff would show. <laughs> and, and now it's but like, that's not such a problem anymore. And now it's like, <laughs> problems worth having. I, you know, the, I'm like I'm like an empty nester, so I, I yeah. like the fact that, uh, that as of recent, I, I've kind of stockpiled enough work to where I'm able to kind of I'm in the company of my own energy, mm -hmm. so um, I'm feeling good about that, and I'm feeling good about the fact that that now that that is even starting to layer. So things that I was excited about in March, I'm like, <laughs> those those can go now. <laughs> <laughs> so you got this going now. Right. So so when I lecture, I feel funny because I'm. Um, it's so hard for me to talk about what I do without telling my life story and I'm 46 years old so that life story is it's taking a little longer than 45 minutes to right. tell <laughs> so it's like when I was 14 I had a pivotal experience and, and uh, so um, so it's, it's hard to abbreviate it because it's it's really it really is a transformative story and, uh, and it, you know it's, it's also probably as important it's formative because you know there is this this, this reality of going from from Belt Suver to the Smithsonian, and that's that's exciting, and people are always excited about those kind of against all odds stories. But mm -hmm. but I think an important thing to demystify is that you know we're talking about a kid who was surrounded and immersed and supported. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much like there's some some seed that, that that wasn't taking root that somebody had to pull back into the soil. The truth of the matter is, is that you know it's a seed that was already in, in very, very enriching soil. Soil, and to kind of extend that that metaphor, you know that that garden was the uh, was the 1980s in Pittsburgh, which was a, a really uh, amazing time for to me for young people. And at the time, of course, we didn't know it because you know we never really appreciate things. But like, if you're trying to look for a, a pre-college program now, if, if it even exists. Um, or, or get a bus for a group of kids to, to go to a, a museum or a field trip. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money logistically. Those kinds of things are just not as, as possible. So when I was a kid, uh, Pittsburgh City Parks was thriving, so there was so many opportunities for kids to, to do something other than just sit around. Sure. And then there were literally, there were opportunities kind of within opportunities. So when these things were happening, in, in many regards, I was, uh, I was kind of, you know, the lone kid saying, "Okay, I'll go," 
but it, but it also provided me with a level of security as as a as a citizen of the city. Mm -hmm. So when I would when I would go to the museum or I, or I went to Kappa, which is literally going to Garfield from from Belt Suver, is kind of a trip. I used to take two buses to to come here um, if I missed a school bus. But you see kids that I knew from the museum and mm -hmm. from you know these other programs from all over the city. So it wasn't so much like I was you know this kind of kid who was in this insular community. I was kind of a kid of a kid of the arts community in so yeah. many regards. And you could kind of own those institutions. They were yours. And you were you were anchored by that community. And I think that's a really important thing for kids because it's it's a it's very difficult for a young person to, to, to kind of push out of that comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It takes a level of confidence and support and familiarity. And and, and sometimes it was the clay, really, literally the clay. So what is it that I have in common with a, a continuing ed class in Manchester and we're listening to NPR and it's all these old white ladies and we're making, well, it was the, it was the clay itself and, and that studio dynamic that kind of grounded that experience and, and really did kind of uh, muffle the uncomfortable silence of, of, of difference. Hmm. So uh, we, we can work while we, uh, while we figure out what we're going to say to each other or, or right. process, you know, what someone's saying across the room or what's on the radio. Right. And, and that kind of, uh, you know, and I really believe that, that those kinds of experiences, um, you know, enabled me to be a citizen of the world. For sure. And it seems that you have this, like, always wanting to be doing something with your hands thing <laughs> that's continued on, as I imagine, as a result of that as well. Well, I, I also think that there's, you know, maybe uh, not to, to deny my own complexity, you know, this, before I, I always say I like, I like persons and not people. So when I'm in these kind of big crowds, I always feel like, I mean, there's a lot of people in my house, I always just rather like, I'll be the one making the hors d'oeuvres. Right. We need more guacamole, you know, because it's just something to do while mm -hmm. everyone else is just kind of perched. Like I'm not a percher. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll, but it's like helped you become an amazing chef, right? Yeah, so it was worth it. And an amazing dishwasher too. <laughs> so it's like I'm the one. Like, let's get the water off the granite. You know, yeah. I'm finding some, <laughs> I'm finding something to do while everybody else is just kind of, you know, with their glass of wine or whatever. Because I, I, it's just a need to, to, and it's also I think uh, maybe for better or for worse, it's it's also to me, I attribute that to being. To having it like a studio identity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's an aspect of that is that is beautifully blue collar, and in 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 a, in a sense that like efficiency is really important. Yeah. Like I want to pick up both of my shoes with one hand, so they're hill to hill, <laughs> and it's it seems like such a small thing, but and I obsess about my kitchen where my kids are afraid to go in there, <laughs> and I, I wish it's like you have to learn my protocol, then you can go in there. But but I think that those kinds of protocols are important for efficiency because. If you're if you're a visual artist, especially a, a three-dimensional artist, you know time and space and the management of time and space are are just a perpetual challenge. Sure. And and space is real estate, and time is money too. So, to me, that kind of efficiency is is kind of been been built. You know, it's like I'm socialized to think about those things all the time. Right. So they they do have a uh, they do have they, they serve as an attribute, and there are instances where they just get on people's nerves. <laughs> Too. But I mean, I think it's helped shape you and you've become, you know, all these things. Like you're an artist, you're an educator, you're an amazing father, you know. Well, the other thing that I really appreciate is how existing with that identity in all these different spaces it kind of, in, in some ways, intersect and inform each one another. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if I'm, if I'm tuning up my car, I don't stop being an artist. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm, if I'm, you know, making stirring a roux, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to not be an artist. So in, in many instances, I think some people try to or feel they should turn off those other identities. And what it really does, in my view, is it, it keeps those aesthetic receptors, you know, activated. Mm. So that way, you know, while I'm tuning up the car, I'm, I'm still devising recipes and I'm saying, you know, there's no reason why I can't add this into my repertoire. So when I go into the studio or I'm in the garage making art, which I am, or I'm in the kitchen making art, what I am, I end up bringing in unsuspected people into the room. And again, I think this is all kind of attributed to some of these earlier experiences where I think that we, we see uncertainty as vulnerability. We see ambiguity as, an, as vulnerability. 
And, and if we're raised to think that, we always feel like we're, we're kind of trying to get back to this security where we know what's going on and we got everything under control. Mm -hmm. Where I feel like, you know, if we're, if we're seeing these things as, as assets, and then we can kind of, uh, you know, we can kind of flow. So it's just kind of, and again, this is kind of cheesy, but like I, I'm, I'm thinking about like Bill Strickland talking now mm -hmm. and at the Manchester, Manchester Crash 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 Guild. Yeah. But I'm also thinking about, you know, something that Bill talks about that is jazz and Bill, you know, predicates a lot of his, you know, uh, formative experiences on you know, the story of Frank Roz at Oliver High School and, and how he had this pivotal experience with this Potter and jazz music. So this idea of taking something, you know, and making something in the moment, but also it's informed mm. by by jazz, which is really about, you know, there is a formula, but there is a certain looseness to that, mm. you know, and there's there's a wonderful story that I like that is, uh, and also Strickland's story involves coffee. So, which is also, um, it's, um, it's a story about Herbie Hancock. He's talking about, uh, who's a jazz musician, for those who don't know Herbie Hancock, <laughs> but he's talking about playing a wrong note, you know? And he was kind of like, he's playing with Miles Davis. He's like, Oops. <laughs> and he said, Miles, is kind of, I got you, you know? And, and Miles is like, he said, Miles took it and made it right. Right. You know? And, 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 and not just took it and made it right, he did it opportunistically, mm. you know? So it wasn't like, what, what you doing here, Herbie? You know, it was more like, okay. Yeah. He's like, you know, you put in cumin instead of cinnamon. Great, I can work with that. We're gonna see where <laughs> we're going. We're gonna see where this goes, yeah. right? So I, I think that there's there's something really important about adjusting one's attitude to that point, mm -hmm. you know. And and again, it's not just about the arts. It's about the landscape, mm -hmm. you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. So as, as an art teacher trainer, as an artist, as a citizen, these are the kind of things I'm talking about. You know, Sears is gone. You know, who would have thunk it, right? And, and, and if we predicate our lives on these things being here forever, right. you know, Google was promised to no one forever, you know? It's true. So I, I think it's just important to think about, again, the fact that, you know, we're gonna see significant change. I mean, Garfield is a, Garfield was a war zone when I was in high school. Mm. And the idea of the people are drinking espresso in Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just funny to me, but it's also, um, it's just telling, mm. you know? Change happens. Thank you, Sharif. This has really been wonderful. We are so thrilled to have you here at BDC. It's, it's really a pleasure. And, and as, as everybody knows, I'm the biggest advocate for the Pittsburgh Glass Center. <laughs>
We're working with the same kinds of principles. We're working with heat, we're working with viscosity, we're working with light. And again, it's not just about the arts, it's about the landscape, you know, and being ready for the inevitability of change. Hi, I'm Courtney, the Accessibility and Outreach Coordinator here at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Welcome to Art on Fire. Come on in. Thank you for joining us tonight for Art on Fire. It is one of my favorite nights of the year, and although we can't all be together in person, we have an exciting lineup for you tonight. We have some wonderful auction items available from talented artists all around the world. Pumpkins are always a popular option, and tonight you get the first dibs on our beautiful handmade fall decorations. To buy a pumpkin, look for the instant buy items on our auction page. Buy handmade glass pumpkins from your desktop, tablet, or phone. Go to pittsburghglasscenter.org or text AOF20 to 76278. Register and click Instant Buy Options to find pumpkins. Welcome to Art on Fire. I'm Heather McElwee, PGC's Executive Director. Thanks for joining us tonight. Art on Fire is the Glass Center's largest annual fundraiser, and we usually raise 10% of our annual operating budget in one night alone. Our success is due to the generous donations of amazing art objects from artists around the world and from our fantastic donors, all of you. We have a lot of exciting things planned for tonight in our first ever virtual Art on Fire, including some of your favorite staples like a glass pumpkin sale, live and silent auctions, and hearing from glass artists from around the world. We have a jam-packed program tonight. Oh gosh, Pittsburgh Glass Center. Um, very important to me. Um, it was the first uh, center that I taught at outside of Bullseye Glass. Um, gave me a really good opportunity to be part of such a community that they have at Pittsburgh. Um, I love their community ethos and how they bring everybody together um, to demonstrate what possibilities there are in glass. Um, I think it's really important that we support these non-profits um, due to, you know, funding of um, these places not happening by government. So we have to help. Um, I'm very happy to help them. Um, my piece that I've donated to PGC this year is called Bird and Bone. Um, it's a kiln form glass platter, um, quite a large scale piece. Um, I enjoy making these as they, they just use pure gravity. There's no molds. Um, and this piece was um, a memorial for the dead birds. I know that sounds a bit morbid, but um, when I moved from London up to Dumfries and Galloway, which is the rural part of Scotland that I live in, um, there were a lot of dead birds on the roads and I, had, I felt I just had to make something for them. So I helped, did a whole series called Bird and Bone and this is one of the pieces. Sending lots of love to everybody at Pittsburgh Glass Centre for this year's auction. Um, sorry, I can't be there. I've never seen one, but um, buy lots. Please help support the centre. And I want to send all my love and support to everyone there. Um, have a fantastic night, people.
would like to thank all of our donating artists, our host committee, and our sponsors, Cooks and Pierce Wealth Management, Petrinos Painting and Contracting, Buchanan, Ingersoll and Rooney, PNC, Rugby Realty, The Rhodes Group, DFL Legal, Dingus, Foster, Luciana, Davidson, and Shabosky, and many more that you see on your screen. As well as our chairs, Jack and Ellen Kessler, and certainly our outstanding guest artist, Sharif Bey. Let's look around the gallery at all the amazing auction items. Don't forget to bid on all of our live and silent items. Here's how. Bid from your desktop, your tablet, or your phone. Go to www.pittsburghglasscenter.org or text AOF20 to 76278. Register and click items to bid. Don't forget to bid on our fantastic auction items. The instructions are on your screen and on PGC's homepage. Thank you for joining us. I'm Allison Ayler, PGC's board president. Let's take a look at some of my favorite pieces in the auction this year. It is my honor to introduce Jack and Ellen Kessler. They are this year's Art on Fire chairs and have been supporters of PGC for many years. They have an amazing art collection. Let's hear directly from them. Hi, we're Ellen and Jack Kessler and we're co-chairing this year's Art on Fire auction and event for the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Our relationship with the Pittsburgh Glass Center goes back to going to this event for many, many years. Um, I actually took a class there a long time ago, which was really interesting uh, to see it from that side. And we've been had an appreciation for glass um, for a long time and always been interested in their program and supporting what they do. Being co-chairs of this event this year is a very different experience. Um, I actually think that the virtual event will be an exciting and um, new kind of opportunity. I think they're going to make it interesting. It's certainly it's bittersweet. We, we would have liked to do something in person and have the live auction and the big party, um, but uh, hopefully we can all socially distance and still support the Glass Center. So. It's an honor to be co-chair of the event this year. Uh, it's a very important event for the city, given the longevity it had, and in particular this year because of the COVID situation, when all charitable organizations are in need for support. The Pittsburgh Glass Center is important to us for, for many reasons. One, we're, we're you know, big supporters of the arts and, and, we're, and of Pittsburgh and the commu this community and supporting arts organization in this community from the smallest arts organizations to very older substantial um, institutions like the Carnegie. Uh, and the Pittsburgh Glass Center has brought so much. It has a national recognition, national reputation. Uh, it's very important to this community. It serves underserved communities. It, it really adds a dimension that no other organization does. And uh, again, as Jack said, we're so honored to be able to support it and co-chair this event. We got involved in Art on Fire by attending the event. And we have for the last several years, we've been on the auctions. Some of our favorite pieces have come from the Art on Fire auction. We have pieces, we also have a home in Florida. We have many pieces or a few pieces down there as well. Uh, glass, as Jack mentioned, has been central to our collection. We really enjoy it. Um, and I think it's an important event. We have not been particularly involved, but we're happy to step up and have this opportunity. Welcome and thank you all for coming tonight. This is, we are excited to be chairing this event, co-chairing this event, and I want to congratulate the Pittsburgh Glass Center, congratulate all the artists and staff and everybody who participated, all the supporters. Thank you for your hard work, all that you've done, and let's have fun. Please enjoy and buy a lot of art. Hi, my name is Janusz Pozniak, and thank you all for tuning in for the Art of Fire Pittsburgh Glass Center auction. I've been coming to Pittsburgh for, well, pretty much since they first started. Dante and I came and taught a class there, and uh, we have both been back many times since, either teaching together or separately. It's a wonderful place that really deserves as much support as they get and deserve. Um, they work so hard to uh, educate the community and uh, local community that is and students from all over the world come to 
learn and create there. So uh, Dante and I have uh, contributed a reticello bowl that we made together to the auction and uh, we hope that you uh, bid generously and really help support this wonderful place uh, that I'm hopefully coming to go and come and teach again next year, 2022, 2021 I should say. And um, you know the Pittsburgh Glass Center does so much for the uh, surrounding area to um, really bring the arts to people that maybe wouldn't otherwise uh, get the chance to see what we can do in glass. So uh, thank you all for tuning in and um, press that button, hit that buzzer, whatever you're doing right now, but uh, bit, bit, bit. Thank you all and everybody that um, works at the Glass Center. You're a wonderful bunch. Chris and Heather steering the ship um, to great things now. They always have and are going to continue to do so in the future. I wish them well. Take care, everybody. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Good evening. I'm Dan Henderson, CEO of Cooks and Pierce Wealth Management. You've worked hard to get to where you are in life. Securing your family's financial future takes smart planning and disciplined execution. It also requires the support of a trusted financial advisor who knows you, understands your goals, and is available to respond when you need them. At Cooks and Pierce, this is our commitment to you as a private client. We are proud to support the artists and staff of Pittsburgh Glass Center for the sixth straight year through Art on Fire. We hope you enjoy the program and you support the Pittsburgh Glass Center with your bids and donations to help sustain them through this challenging time. Thank you and stay healthy. There will be four items in the live auction tonight by Blaine Steiner, Nick Mount, Kathleen Mulcahy, and Sharif Bay. These items will close over the next hour during our program. We'll also hear from each one of the artists throughout the program, and then the item will close. Stay tuned. The premier auction items will close at 9 p.m. Eastern. The silent auction items will close at 10 p.m. Eastern. Let's get started with our first live auction item of the night. Blaine is an emerging artist who was most recently a tech apprentice at PGC this spring. She's now starting her master's program in glass at Tulane University this fall. She created this breathtaking cast glass sculpture for the auction. Let's hear from Blaine about what she got from the Tech Apprentice program and what she's been up to since she left Pittsburgh this summer. My relationship with the Pittsburgh Glass Center started when I took a class there um, a couple summers ago. They have a really great scholarship program with some universities where they'll provide half the tuition for um, a summer class once a year and then the university pairs up and pays the other half. And so I took a class with Anna Mosowski when I was there. And from that, I kind of got to know the people there a little bit, saw what a great program they had going um, for the tech apprenticeship program, talked to Will Haynes when I was there and ended up applying to the program when I graduated undergrad at Salisbury University. And I got in and the technical side of things has always been really interesting to me. I like being autonomous so I like being able to fix things when they break and not have to call someone um, which is a large part of why the tech program appealed to me just getting better at that and then it was also just a really great program for being able to make your work when you get out of undergrad I think that a lot of people are in this little bubble in undergrad and then they get out and they're like oh god here's the real world I don't have a studio that's being paid for anymore and so that was a really great transition for after the fact um, that held out till I came here to Tulane. In the Shadows was the first sculpture I think that I made where I was treating glass like a stone and carving it away. I was doing a lot of dry grinding um, just like you would with a chunk of granite and so I had actually in my sketches planned for that to be paired with a granite counterpart and then when I cast the piece of glass um, it came out of the oven and I liked it so much I was like I don't think I want to put this on a granite base or like have it flow into another piece um, and so I just took it to my little station for grinding and was working on it and it was the first piece I worked very intuitively and that was the first one I think where I really got a feel for how I could work intuitively and still plan a bit. 
Um, and as I was putting in a curve somewhere else, it became apparent where I wanted a curve, you know, somewhere across the piece to kind of relate to that. And so it was the first one where I was having a conversation with myself and the work, which was really exciting to feel. I support the Pittsburgh Glass Center for a lot of reasons. I think that one of the things that they do really well is they support up and coming people. Um, you don't have to have already made it. They recognize people that are on the up, which I think is really important. It's hard to get out there and into this world where an emerging artist residency still expects you to usually have come out of grad school and done other residencies. Um, and so I think that supporting the little guy is something that they do really well. And just the atmosphere that they create. Um, I've been to a couple of different studios and Pittsburgh is very accepting. Um, I think that that was probably the first place that I went to work where I, I don't know, they're just a really special group of people. Um, and I think that they do a great job uniting the glass world. Uh, I really wish the best for Art on Fire and Pittsburgh. Blaine's piece will be closing in just a few minutes, so get your final bids in now. Well, I, um, I was aware of the Pittsburgh Glass Center right after it started. I, I, um, I kind of connected um, briefly, I think it was around 2000 when I was teaching at the Manchester Craftsman's Guild. We were already sending high school students over to, to explore glass. But officially, I would say um, in 2017, I applied for a program that the Glass Center offers um, specifically for non-glass artists. And it was a really amazing opportunity for me to not only try something that I had never endeavored to try, but also it gave me an opportunity to kind of uh, return home to Pittsburgh, which, which I know and love. So uh, it, was, it was a transformative experience. And in many ways, it was uh, kind of a catalyst for me and my, my career in terms of uh, positioning me to get a lot more exposure than I had in the last 20 or so years uh, working as a studio artist. For the uh, Pittsburgh Glass Center auction, I, I donated a piece that is kind of, uh, you know, in, in many ways, it's, it's a one, it's kind of stems from a quintessential Sharif Bay work. And it is one of the adornment inspired wall pieces that it kind of comes to be by way of the uh, creating and, and composing multiple necklace bead pieces. So bead pieces in this necklace, many of them are made um, by, by hand as pinch pots and later finished and polished and integrated into the necklace. When I was at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, I started to make components, not only in glass, but components that kind of served as connectors from one segment of the wall piece or, or conceptual necklace to the other. So in this case here, I'm gonna change the camera here. So here's a new one that kind of is stemming from the original that was that will be auctioned off. It has these kind of connector glass rings that will connect one segment of the piece to the other. One of the other things that I noticed when I started working in glass is although when we think about glass, we might think about the fragility of glass, but cast glass is actually a pretty dense material. And especially as it compares to a cast clay object, which is much more fragile. So these things serve as a connector, but they're also very stable as they pull this piece together. So I'll show you some of the other kinds of forms that, that I use that are made out of clay to unify this piece. In this case, these kind of beaker forms are arranged in kind of an alternate repetition along with these more spherical forms. The central uh, kind of uh, charm or crown jewel of this adornment piece is a recurring form that I make often. Um, and it's usually called the gold bird or the copper bird, depending on what kind of metallic surface is in the, um, in the center. And it kind of is in many regards formed from a conventional pinch potted vessel. And this will be strung in the middle as you can see. But one of the things that, you know, it kind of relates to is this idea of the vessel as an offering and showcasing 
that as, as somewhat of a, of a jewel in itself. So if you see the center vessel, it's, it's a very intimate kind of coupled interior that in many ways uh, reflects this idea of, of the hand as a cup. It serves as somewhat of a conceptual offering. The Goldberg piece, you know, is originally much more kind of, uh, I don't want to say conservative, but more simplistically composed, where it's just one single ring. But one of the things that I started doing at the Glass Center is kind of combining these different strands of beads. Some of them were concentric with multiple layers and glass connectors in between. In this case, it's more linear. Um, so as, as kind of like a, really in, in some ways, the, the, the kind of stability of this material lent, lent itself to kind of compositions that I could not otherwise pull off. So in this piece here, as opposed to having just one or two strands, I'm now basically combining multiple strands where I have a ring of beads here, a ring of beads here, these central glass connectors unifying a whole nother side. So I actually have four different strings of beads connected with two centerpieces in this case. So, um, so again, one of the things that changed for me, sorry about that, one of the things that changed for me when I started to work in glass is in many regards, the engineering of the work changed. And it was, it was actually quite timely because prior to that, I was working almost exclusively in clay and the pieces started to get increasingly heavier. So once I started working in glass, that was a lot heavier and a lot denser than clay, I had to resolve the engineering and the weight of the pieces. So that's when I started using more and more of this reinforced steel. So uh, again, it was, it was actually very timely because right after that, I started to make larger and larger you know commissions and pieces for museums that uh that kind of necessitated that engineering so again the glass center pushed me to kind of think about this kind of problem solving right as i kind of needed to resolve these pieces from, from an engineering perspective one of the things that we're going to endeavor to do this evening is to kind of process an idea that i've been working through for for quite a few years in glass one of the things that i learned by way of the idea furnace experience is how glass is such a different material, but also such a different rhythm and pace than ceramics. And it is kind of uh, in many regards to push me to, to be a little bit more patient, but also to, to process uh, material and ideas in a different way. So the piece I have here that is kind of conventionally a ceramic piece is one of my ceremonial vessels that is made from earthenware it's hand-built as well as wheel thrown, but then it's impaled countlessly with these uh, industrial ceramic shards. Now, what's important to note is we're not exactly trying to replicate this in glass because it actually represents itself pretty well in clay. But what I'm interested in seeing is how glass as a language and as a process uh, kind of adds to that conversation. So we're going to be doing some glass blowing as well as glass casting, but also working with an experimental surface, not to replicate the shards here, but to replicate the kind of uh, what I call quiet noise that comes from the unification of a lot of different Im information, but also as it kind of uh, compo is composed within a, on, on and in reconciliation with, with like a former surface. So, um, that's what we're going to pretty much, uh, I don't want to say try to do because we're going to, we're going to do something. We're going to experiment with glass and multiple uh, processes within glass traditions to see what happens. Let's get back to the auction. Nick Mount has been one of the leading figures in the Australian studio glass movement since the early 1970s. And he was recently named a national living treasure in Australia. Over the subsequent decades, as both a teacher and a practitioner, he has made significant contributions to the development of glass as an artistic medium around the world. His work is informed, but not confined, by traditional Venetian techniques, as can be seen in this oversized scent bottle. We're so sorry he couldn't join us tonight, but we know he's watching and we send him our love.
Next piece will be closing in just a few minutes, so get your final bids in now. My experience with the Pittsburgh Glass Center has been uh, profound and deeply meaningful to me because it's um, it exists within um, the truth that as a black artist in the environment and in the landscape of Pittsburgh and in the ecosystem regionally and nationally, there has been an awakening of arts organizations and institutions to the value of black lives and to the value of the lives and the work of people of color and marginalized communities and trans lives and queer lives. And inside of that awareness of, of really needing to um, be present to an entire human community and an institution, there's the way that I have sometimes been used as a guinea pig for institutions that are floating through different places and language around equality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and I have, uh, have actually had experiences inside of uh, different institutions and systems that are have been really harmful because the system, the institution hasn't done the internal work to be present to the ways uh, to be really transparent with the ways that they've been harmful and to move into a transparent process of justice within the system, within the institution. So I've been like guinea pigs, a guinea pig in so many different residencies and so many different institutions where people are trying out justice without doing um, the dimensional internal work. And so I was really, I had a chip on my shoulder going into my residency at the Pittsburgh Glass Center because of past harm that I'd experienced and being one sort of going in like, what's gonna happen this time? What are they gonna say? What are they gonna do that lets me know that my presence here isn't about my life and work as an artist, but my presence here is about them trying to change their face and change their image as a community institution, but without doing the work, but really about image and about branding. And so I had this chip on my shoulder going into my literally my first day at, in residence at the Pittsburgh Glass Center and um, I moved through the world with the truth that um, art and love are intimately connected they're part of the same engine and in the love part of the engine of my art making life and process is that I share the sharing is a huge part of the joy of being an artist so I bring kids with me, like the kids from my neighborhood. I'll be like, I'm going to a museum. I'm doing a talk. Do you want to come? And so I said, I have a residency at a glass center. Do you want to see what it's like um, to make glass to the, for this little kid in my neighborhood? And she came with me to the glass center. It was like the first day of my residency, I think. And I was working with Jason, um, maybe the first or second day of my residency. Whatever it was, I had not lost the edge of experiencing uh, of waiting to experience something bad happen to me um, and my residency, which had been so familiar to me. So I was really sort of hyper vigilant about the way as I was being spoken to and the ways I was being treated, just sort of waiting for something bad to happen. And um, what ends up happening this one specific day that I bring this kid with me is that I get a phone call while I'm at the residency and she's sort of being shown around and work is happening in the hot shop and I get a phone call that says Vanessa um, the riot police are in front of your house like the uh, SWAT team is in front of your house are you okay is everything okay and so I call my neighbor and I was like is the SWAT team at my house and she said no they're at the house two doors from yours which was the house of the little child that I had brought with me and so over the course of several hours this SWAT situation is unfolding in my neighborhood and I have the child of these people with me at the glass center and at some point I had to tell the people at the glass center hey this thing is happening and I have this kid and I don't know if I'm going to be able to take her home I don't know if she's going to have a home to go back to it's really up in the air and so I had this anxiety um and I and and you know, anxiety for many reasons, because I care about her family, I care about her, but she's with me at the Glass Center and I'm supposed to be doing residency work. And what was really amazing that day that helped me to understand that the Glass Center was receiving my presence there as not a tool or a token of a sort of mission to be inclusive or to have be diverse or anything, but that they actually experienced me as a human being is the moment when I saw Heather 
the executive director of the Glass Center carrying the little girl on her back through the space and they were laughing and they ordered her food and it was really a space of community, a space that felt like family, a space that felt safe, which then that experience of seeing the ways that that care extended beyond my um, presence and my labor as an artist, but extended to me as a human being and as a member of community with other human beings, which might sound like an oversimplification of being in human relationship, but it's not because I find that it is actually missing from so many different institutions and organizations. So um, that allowed me to be whole as a human being, as an artist, as a black person in Pittsburgh, in the region, in this nation present with all of that in the space, which allowed me to create work then that held um, a dimensional substance um, of, of uh, in my creative process. I was able to show up more wholly as a human being because at the Pittsburgh Glass Center I had been treated as a whole human being and not less than that. And that allowed me to create work and to be challenged in the creation of work and to push myself creatively and to push the themes that I worked in in a way that I didn't have to be afraid that the institution was going to censor me and they didn't. Um, Pittsburgh Glass Center is um, Honestly, nationwide, one of my favorite organizations. Um, I travel a lot. I get to visit a lot of spaces. Um, and I am always impressed with the way that they hold space and they make space for wholeness, which is really an important part of being a community citizen. It is an important part to the lives of the human beings of everyone who comes in the space and interacts around the space and lives the space because there is, um, it is a lie that there are all these places of separation in our humanity. And I found that the Pittsburgh Glass Center breaks down as many of these um, really harmful boundaries to our wholeness and our humanity in the ways that they move and create. Um, I love the Pittsburgh Glass Center.
say that 2020 has been challenging would be an understatement. At the end of February, we were on track to have our best year ever, with class enrollments far surpassing our wildest expectations. By the end of March, we were looking at refunds for classes in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. PGC closed to the public on March 16th and didn't reopen until July 21st, over four months later. When the pandemic first hit, we realized that it was going to have the most immediate and severe impact on organizations with very strong earned income, like PGC. We made the tough decision to furlough our entire staff to 50% and to turn off both of our glass making furnaces for the month of April. Thankfully, we received a payroll protection loan that enabled us to bring all staff back to full time and we were also able to turn back one of our furnaces back on for our virtual tours and demonstrations. While we were closed to the public, we found creative ways to keep people engaged. For Earth Day, we gave away over 400 pounds of glass via free mosaic kits to help people stay creative while staying home. In May and June, we piloted virtual field trips and have developed them into a distance learning program for this fall. We also spent the summer developing our to-go glass kits, which include fusing and mosaic supplies that have been incredibly popular. Since launching the kits in mid-July, we've sold over 300, resulting in a new earned income stream. Despite the fact that we've opened our studios to artists for rental, opened our gallery to the public, and have successfully sold hundreds of glassmaking kits, it's still impossible to invite the public in to blow glass given the current situation. Activities in the hot shop that require close proximity for instruction, like our popular Make It Now activities, cannot take place for at least the rest of the year. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged PGC financially, and we are projecting more than a 50% decrease in earned revenue this year alone. We anticipate the impact to earn revenue to continue well into 2021. That's why we need your help tonight. Please consider making a donation that will help us keep our furnaces glowing bright and our safe community outreach programs viable. Here's how. Follow instructions on the screen. Donate from your desktop, tablet, or phone. Donate at www.pittsburghglasscenter.org or text AOF20 to 76278. Register and click Donate. We look forward to a time when we can run classes at full capacity again but until then, we'll continue to engage the public in meaningful ways with a range of creative glass activities. Thank you for your support tonight. Now let's get back to the auction. Local artist Kathleen Mulcahy really needs no introduction as the co-founder of Pittsburgh Glass Center. She's received countless awards over the years, including being named Artist of the Year by the State of PA. Kathleen stopped making her signature spinner series in 2005. This one was created in 2004 with the help of her late husband, Ron Desmond. The Spinner series brought back childhood memories of her dad and mom's toy store. Let's go to Kathleen in her home studio to hear a special message. Kathleen Mulcahy, I'm an artist, independent artist and co-founder of the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Probably an odd story to have created the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Someone came to us from the Mon Valley Initiative, Ron and I, they came to our house and they said, we want you to think about uh, a creative center in the town of Elizabeth. And we said, no, thank you. And they left and then Silvio Beretta came back about two months later and said, we have been all over Pittsburgh looking for somebody to do this and you are the only people that can do this. If we were going to do something like the Pittsburgh Glass Center, like what it is today, it had to be world class. Our vision for the Glass Center was to create an amazing facility, world class, with artists coming from all over the world to be in a neighborhood, in a community, in a city rubbing shoulders with diverse populations and bringing people together. I want to say from the bottom of my heart, I love the Glass Center with every inch of my being. It's, for me, it's been a miracle. To me, the Glass Center has blossomed 
and I get to see this beautiful flower every day. I love them for it. Thank them all. Kathleen's piece will be closing in just a few minutes, so get your final bids in now. Let's hear from Bob Jones from Brothers and Sisters Emerging in Garfield. Thank you. Um, my connection with the Glass Center started some years back. I'm serving as the president and CEO of a youth development organization here in Garfield, Brothers and Sisters Emerging. And we were searching for activities for our young people to take part in, in our after school program. I thought connecting with the Glass Center would be a really good idea. It would be um, an opportunity for young people to learn a non-traditional skill, to take part in some non-traditional arts activities. So the Glass Center was just an automatic fit. You know, um, it, again, it's necessary for the community itself to be connected in many ways, but through the arts, it's, it's awesome. It gives, again, kids, adults, and families opportunity to learn, have fun, and explore and utilize their imagination. I'd like to give a big shout out to the Pittsburgh Glass Center and send my well wishes to their growth and development and their continued progress. I'd also like to send a, a big, big up to Arts on Fire with the hopes that um, what they imagine and what they foresee coming out of it, it turns out great and it's really good for them and beneficial. Let's go up to the hot shop to see what Sharif has been up to in our studios. I'd like to talk a little bit about the process for which we cast glass here, which is very different than blown glass that we do in the hot shop. In my case, actually, I start out using a clay form as I am a clay artist. This form was actually um, the original form was actually made in East Liberty in the Indigo Hotel. And from the clay form, we rake, make a rubber mold. And from the rubber mold, we pour hot wax. This is one that's actually still in here. So you see how that works. And then this form, we actually create a plaster mold from upside down. And I've been working closely with Madam Ashley McFarland here. Who, uh, whose job title has changed many, many times over the years, but she's essentially a casting guru. And please feel free to interject anything or correct me if I say anything that's not absolutely truthful. So she basically helps me build like a plaster silica mold around this, and then we steam out the wax. So the wax steams out, and then here's the fun part. So this form actually goes into the kiln in order to get the form, we put this yellow fret in here. Kind of looks like candy corn. And then we put these cubes of glass inside this cavity. Very different glass than we use in, in the hot shop. So this is like a different glass specifically engineered for casting as opposed to the glass we use for, for blowing. These glasses flow different, they have different viscosities. So after this form comes out of the kiln, as I mentioned earlier, there's still some cold working to be done. So this comes out of the kiln like this. And we have to cut this and sandblast, I mean, uh, and, and bandsaw it and sandblast it. And then this is one of the many motif. I would have dozens of these that would be a part of the eventual necklace wall piece that I create. <laughs> okay. So the kiln is up at top temperature right now. Um, the molds go through a whole drying process and they go up slowly to 1575. Um, it's just getting up there, so the glass is still just starting to melt. You guys can see those fillets in the top reservoir there. They're starting to get soft, and eventually they'll flow down into that bead form. And this is basically the last chance we get to check on our molds and the glass before we send it down to room temperature slowly. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is the, the, the lid of this ceremonial vessel that I'm making in glass was made in the cold, excuse me, was made in the kiln shop. So it's actually a cast glass form. The base of this form will be made in the hot shop via um, a master glass blower. Now one of the things that's gonna make this form unique is that we're gonna integrate um, these hot clay, excuse me, hot glass shards into it. As you can see here, we have them on a plate. So once we get the form to a reasonable uh, shape, we're gonna to start to essentially uh, penetrate or impale this molten glass form with these shards pretty continually. So there's gonna be, you know, I would say dozens and dozens of these shards 
impressed into this clay form. And then we're gonna ultimately put the two together. So it's, it's essentially kind of merging these two processes in these two different shops. I also wanna add that, you know, this, this rim has been kind of perfectly calibrated to fit the eventual bird form that we finished off in the kiln shop. So the idea is we're gonna essentially marry these two processes. The lid, which is the kind of ceremonial bird on the top, this from the, the casting, with the, which is the lost wax that I talked about earlier, with the, uh, with the hot work we're doing in here. So at this point, basically what we're doing is we're, we're just fitting the lid on the prototype so you get an idea what it looks like. Obviously the eventual form is slightly more volumetric and larger in itself, but at this point we're able to just kind of fit the lid and see how it looks. The other thing that I'm going to eventually do is get a pair of towel snips and kind of go back to kind of kind of uh, kind of showcase the, the rigidity of these kind of individual shards because as you see because of the heat some of them have since been rounded off but I really want that sharp edge to kind of create that dynamic on the outside and I just want to thank everybody for their support of the Pittsburgh Glass Center and I want to thank you all for this opportunity it's been wonderful and also again I have to you know just kind of reiterate what a wonderful opportunity the Idea Furnace has been for me and what it's done for my work. Thank you everybody. The most important part of the evening has arrived. This is our final live auction item donated by our honorary artist Sharif Bay. Bay is from Balthuver, a neighborhood on the south side of Pittsburgh. He first discovered ceramics as a teenager at Manchester Craftsman's Guild. Sharif was an idea furnace artist in residence for over a year at PGC and produced a new body of work that included necklace forms that incorporated glass and ceramics together. Sharif's recent accolades are way too numerous to mention, but include being part of the 2018 Renwick Invitational and having five pieces acquired by the Carnegie Museum of Art and receiving the Pollock Krasner Award. In this piece, Aqua Phoenix, Sharif incorporates several of his signature ceramic bead forms, including a lustered bird with cast glass rings. Sharif's piece will be closing in just a few minutes, so get your final bids in now. Thank you for joining us tonight. Don't forget, there is still time to donate, buy pumpkins, and bid on the silent auction. The premium auction items close at 9 p.m. Eastern, and the silent auction closes at 10 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much for joining us for this year's virtual Art on Fire. Have a good night. Mm.